Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about Zen Orchestra and XCPNG and how the backups are facilitated. One of the great things about the way XCPNG works, and of course with Zen Orchestra, the company behind it, Vates being support for both of these, has created a very tightly integrated product when it comes to backups, restores, and just makes it really simple to do. Now, for those of you that want to keep your cloud at home. Yes, this is all open source. Yes, this is available for you to compile yourself. And you can find a link down below where I talk about that in a separate video. For those of you that are in the business world, yes, this is fully supported, changes your total cost of ownership if you're looking at switching away from other hypervisors over to XCPNG, because often you pay for a third-party backup utility. Zen Orchestra has this integrated, has subscriptions, comes with support. So it checks all the business boxes, but can also be completely used in the home lab or your testing environments as needed for free. I just recommend if you want to use it in business, go ahead and buy that support, support the project. And, you know, it's a great product overall. What we're going to do, though, is not death by slideshow. There's only a couple slides I want to show. And the reason why is I want to make sure we are all on the same page when it comes to the language and the terms used for how they describe it. Then we'll jump into hands-on. If you don't want to watch the slideshow, uh, everything's time indexed down below so you can jump to the part that's most interesting to you. So let's start and get the language down because I want to make sure people understand how the remotes work, what a remote is, what a pool is, and what a host is, and how these things integrate and the different backup types that are supported. All right, let's start with hosts and pools. A host is the individual system it runs on. A pool is a pool of other hosts or even single hosts that the host is in. So even if you only have a singular XCPNG host, it technically belongs to a pool, it's just lonely and by itself. As you increase the number of hosts that are in a resource pool, so you can have three, you can have, well, well, more than three, you can have a single instance, though, of Zen Orchestra talking to all of these simultaneously. Generally speaking, Zen Orchestra is going to run as a virtual machine inside of one of your hosts. It doesn't have to run on all of them or any of them. I bring it up because you can actually run Zen Orchestra completely separate on its own hardware if you so wanted to. That is an option that maybe people don't always think about, but usually it's running as a virtual machine on one of your hosts. And if you ever needed redundant copies, yes, you could always use one of these backup methods to keep an extra copy on another host uh, or just have your own copy somewhere else, not on your host to be able to manage them. A few thoughts on that, uh, but there's important aspects that affect where you put it. One of the ways it works is it's pulling the data from the host, any one of these hosts or all of them, going through Zen Orchestra and then to the NAS storage. There's no dotted line here between this host and this NAS storage when it comes to backups. It always passes through Zen Orchestra. So you have to think about that from a communication method. And then we have the NAS storage options. You can have many of them. You can even have S3, which is in beta right now, but there's S3 options as well. To further things, if you're wondering if it'll work remotely, yes, this is where the XO proxy comes in. I'm not going to dive a lot into it, but it is a documented feature and a really cool feature where you can have Zen Orchestra at your main site. And we have clients that are doing this. It talks to your local NAS storage. It talks to all the on-site Zen pools that are set up and all the hosts on there. But then over a VPN, you can then have it talking to these other hosts. Now, this is the one exception where it does not, when you do a backup, talk to the NAS that is on the remote end. You could do that, but obviously doing it over a VPN may not be as effective, especially when you're talking about a lot of backups and a lot of data flowing. So they have a tool called XO Proxy. It's basically a mini version of Zen Orchestra that is running on site. So Zen Orchestra can then talk to XO Proxy, and then that flow goes from these hosts to XO Proxy to the NAS storage. Technically, it's flowing through XO proxy each time. So the same rule applies, as I mentioned, where the data doesn't go directly from these to the NAS storage. But it's basically, I could have made this a little clear. I just want to be very clear on this part, though. It is going from XO proxy to the NAS storage flowing out of these. So that level of control is still there. And it's a great way if you have many remote sites to have one Zen Orchestra managing, keeping all your data in one place, managing all the different facets that are going on even on your remote sites, including your backups, all the reporting and everything else, uh, but just facilitated this way. Great feature. Remotes. Now, this is something, we'll jump back over here, make sure we're clear. Remotes are all the different storage destinations that you've set up for your backups to land on. Because they're called remotes, sometimes it causes a little bit of confusion, but the remote options are local file on the XO server itself. This is a weird option because I don't necessarily recommend it unless you know what you're doing, but you could create some types of shares inside of your Zen Orchestra server and then 
point it at that local file. If not, you're backing up within it. But if you have an external and you've created some storage spots on that XO server, it is a feature you can use. Next is going to be SMB. So it'll facilitate connecting over SMB to, I use a lot of TrueNAS, but Synology works just as well. I've done a lot of testing with both. Same thing goes with NFS. Synology and TrueNAS are two that I've tested, but I'm sure it works with most any NAS or server that you have set up that'll support NFS and SMB. And Amazon or S3 compatible, it's a beta feature, but yes, you can tie it to things like MinIO and other S3 compatible or natively to Amazon S3. Details about the remotes. Encryption is supported, but in early release. Next, you can store the backups as multiple data blocks instead of a whole VHD file. This creates 500 to 1,000 files per backed up terabyte, but allows faster merge and requires a file system that can support it, such as CFS or BTRFS, ButterFS. I really make sure, and they give you a warning when you check this box, it's a great way to have faster merges, but but you have to make sure you're not going to run out of the uh, file system's ability to handle thousands of files. It's probably better also, uh, most of the time I find NFS to be a little bit more effective while doing that many files, but this is all comes down to the performance of the target and the NAS that you have set up. But keep that in mind, you can't just use a standard file system because if you have a lot of backups, you could run out of uh, the uh, file system's ability to handle that quantity of files. It's not a storage size at that point, it's a quantity a file problem uh, and you, you don't want that backup types and where they land this is the important part full backups land on one of the remotes nfs smb etc delta backups land on the remote now i put the delta symbol next to delta and continuous replication because the equivalent is called continuous replication but that lands on host storage so it doesn't even have to be in the same pool this is actually a really cool disaster recovery feature where you're continuously replicating the vm onto another host that host can be in another pool kind of a neat feature and by doing so, you created this ability to, if the main host dies, you can instantly start it up based on the last time you ran that. And it's only doing a delta each time. So from the first seed, the first one's going to be big, but then it's incremental afterwards to do continuous replication because it's only syncing on the deltas between the last time that was ran. Disaster recovery is more like a full backup. Once again, lands on host storage, but it's doing a full copy of the virtual machine to the other host storage, whichever that storage destination may be. Be. rolling snapshots it's under backup technically it's not a backup it's just a rolling snapshot but this is where you would control that you can have a rolling snapshot on a regular basis running with whatever schedule you want so you can have consistent snapshots of it but technically i know and i just want to make sure i'm clear on this it's not a backup it's a state and time stayed on the same host storage Finally, pool, metadata, and exo config to the remote. I really like this feature because the way Zen works is it's like a database of all the VMs, their status. And the way you back it up is really simple. You can just use Zen Orchestra and it grabs all that pool metadata, all the settings, all the networks you created, all those functions. And you can easily restore it right through Zen Orchestra. So if you somehow deleted or wanted to uh, redo a bunch of networks, but you messed something up, you actually can roll back in time fairly easily and restore the pool metadata. They've actually had some nice restore features for it because before uh, if you'd watched my past videos the restore features were uh, not all integrated you kind of restore it from the command line so be careful restoring because you don't want to break anything next is the xo config itself so all the settings you put into zen orchestra all the backups you build and everything else the configuration of that can be backed up as well and that can all be scheduled as part of the backup backup features smart backups based on vm tags this is used a lot when you have large environments and you want to add a VM without updating the backup job. You can use tagging extensively throughout Zen Orchestra to really understand where all your VMs are. And for example, let's say we're going to use the tag production or critical. And by doing that, you can have a backup that just looks for the tags. That way, as you have developers maybe putting systems together, you can go, oh, I need to add this one to the backup. So I'm just going to change a tag on it. And then the smart backup will just pick up on the tags and apply whatever backup job is looking for those tags. It's really nice because you can build simple workflows this way without having to modify the backup jobs. Automatic VM restore health check this is just really cool this does so not by sending a screenshot like you may have seen some other tools use but instead by making sure the zen tools start by doing this you're able to do the automatic vm restore and by the way it does not have to be on the same host you can actually have it even on a separate pool doing it so you can have a, a test environment that you send the backups 
to to test and this is all automated and what it does is boots up the machine with no network interface therefore it will not interfere with current running vms it looks for the zen server tools to start and once the tools start it knows the machine must have booted up to get that far really clever and very simple way to do your backup automation testing backup vm in a running state with memory this is actually cool not just uh, for backing up to have an exact running version of it, but it's also neat for forensics if you ever wanted to have a forensic snapshot and actually pull through it. There's some advanced use cases you can dig into and uh, read about on that. Per job backup transfer rate control, any specific job can be controlled and rate limited if needed uh, for certain bandwidth requirements. Maybe you want it just to go a little slower. That's an option. Uh, the default, of course, is going to be full speed. File level restores only with Delta backups. This is actually an interesting feature I don't use often, but hey, want to make sure you knew it's in here. Backup reports, email, Slack, webhooks, XMPP, and of course a REST API. You can easily get all your backup data pretty integrated to whatever workflow you want because between the normal reports, having that REST API gives you more features for doing some of the backup monitoring. Uh, I think it's really cool that they've integrated that. And it, the REST API supports more than backups. This is just a function within the REST API they have uh, that also supports that. Finally, documentation, RTFM. There's a lot of it. They've done a good job of documenting it. I've got a link to the documents down below. And uh, I really think they've just made it easy to uh, understand and they've got plenty of graphics and things like that in there too. Let's jump into my lab and show you some of the backups and kind of give you an idea what it looks like. Now I want to start with showing the version I'm running right here and also of note want to use in production. Yes, this is the free open source compiled version I did. I did this so people using it in home lab can, you know, get the question answered definitively. Can I use this in my home lab and test with it with all the features you talked about, Tom? Yes, you can. If you're a business, yes, head over to uh, their zenorchestra.com if you're interested in buying a license for it. Now, the first thing you need to do is set up your remotes before you get backups going. Here's how the remotes look. So it's under settings, remotes, and remotes are the different destinations. You can see I have this one right here, and we're going to go ahead and test my remote. I like the fact that they have a test button because once you set one up, you can say, all right, can I read and write to that remote? Important thing to uh, make sure. When you're setting them up, you can choose NFS, local, as I said, if you have a local spot, you want to do this, uh, NFS or SMB and Amazon S3. Of note, and I don't have a proxy set up, but you would select the proxy when you have it set up in a way, as I mentioned at slide two, where you're using it remotely over VPN, you can have the proxy workers and it would list the remotes for that. So that's another option when you're setting these up. Now, once the remote is set up, you can always go back and edit it. And it sometimes gets a little confusing if you click the edit button it's actually bringing all the data back down here. So you can go, oh, okay, this is where the edit button is. Um, just clarify on that. And if you need any special options, here's where you would click to add any special parameters or options as needed, for example, in the NFS shares or in the SMB shares. Something else worth noting is uh, the subfolder options that have been added. I like this because this can help organize backups. You can actually build a secondary remote, but have a second folder in there. And this is some edge use cases that we found helpful for clients when uh, they needed things broke out differently because on the back end where they were landing them, they're able to send them to different places based on the subfolder for different retention policies. Now, once you've got all that configured and we'll go up here to the VMs I have set up and I have this backup testing demo, just one VM we're going to do some testing with here. I've actually already got some snapshots uh, that are part of a Delta backup. We can just run another Delta backup real quick. I really like the way it attaches the backup jobs that are related to this VM right here. So we'll go ahead and uh, make things easy. I'm going to copy that and we'll go over here to create a new backup. And while that's running, we'll back up another one and we'll create a new one. Back to backup testing demo, another one. Select the VMs. This is how you can select all the VMs that are on here, running, not running. You can turn it into smart mode where we only do it based on a tag a VM has. And then you would see which pools do they reside on, et cetera, et cetera. But we're just going to leave it here and choose this one. We can choose the schedule. Now, the schedule is a one-to-many relationship. So if we said daily, and we wanted this to be a daily backup uh, at this time or whatever time we wanted it to be. So we'll set it to maybe we want to back up there. All right, great. We can do that. And we're going to hit the retention policy daily. Cool. Hit OK. I got to choose the backup type here. Uh, maybe we want to do a full backup once a day. Now, let me 
go back and edit this because now it wants to know what's the retention policy. Uh, we'll keep three of them. Pretty simple. And then we can just hit OK. I'm not going to enable it because I don't want it to run at 11 today. And choose the remotes. I'll choose the only remote I have. But you can actually choose multiple remotes. This can go to multiple destinations simultaneously. Now, because this is a full backup, disaster recovery is similar to a full backup. So that means I can click on disaster recovery and then choose a target storage repository. So this chooses the remote. This chooses the repository where you want this to go. So disaster recovery type, as I said, goes to another host. And so I want one copy to go to a host. I want one copy to go to my remote for a backup. And then go down here to like your advanced settings. And you can say, do you want these to run concurrently or how many you want to run concurrently? Email the reports only on failure always. Select the proxy once again, if there was a proxy that needed to be done. Compression, it does support uh, ZTSD, XCPNG only, but good compression on there. Offline backup means go ahead and uh, make sure you shut this VM down. And you can also say offline with memory or normal when you do these. So there's different options uh, that you break down. Pretty simple. Back to the scheduling over here. Once you chose the backup type, you can still have multiple schedules for that particular backup type. But you notice it grays out Delta and continuous replication. So let's go ahead and rework this. If we start with Delta, that allows continuous replication because I said both of these are Delta types, so they're only doing differential. But same rules apply for the backup and everything else. So you can get the idea. They're pretty easy to set up when you're uh, building these. And we'll go ahead and hit Save here or Create. And by doing so, we can go back over to our VMs. And now that other backup job has become attached because he knows it's associated with this. If you associate a backup with multiple VMs, each one of those VMs under the backup tab will show this right here. Really simple the way they tie them together. So you can start from the backup page or the VM. And then for any one of these, you can see, click to see matching VMs. And it would give you a list of all the VMs that match on there. Now, finally, let's go over to the backup jobs and overview. And let's talk about, well, the one we just did. Here's what it looks like. So transferred using MBD, this is a new feature for network block device, I believe it stands for, uh, where it went. Here's the backup report, what it looks like. It looks the same in an email when you send it. But full backup demo with health check. Let's look at that one. This is the cooler one. So we did the snapshot. We sent it here. So here's our start and end for the backup. Now here's the health check part, which of course is successful, and you can tell it to notify and failure. It transferred it, restored this VM. Duration was two minutes. Gives you the speed, it started the VM on this time here, start end, and then it destroys the VM when it's done. It's just really a simple flow. You can download this as a log. You can copy it to the clipboard. You can report a bug right from here. So if you want to drive into it further, and by the way, backup job failed. I love that when you do this, it took you right over to start the post over on GitHub and it copied all the data in here. Now, of course, make sure, because um, I have not submitted this issue because it's not an issue, make sure when you're doing this that there's nothing personal you didn't want in there. It's not submitting any of your data outside of the backup log, but hey, they've made it easy to follow this flow all the way through to even reporting if there's a problem so you can engage with the team and then give them all the accurate information or relevant information that they have to start the conversation. Uh, I think they just did this at such a smooth workflow. It's really impressive. Now I want to talk about my production environment and doing restores because I have a lot more backups in here. So you can see the size of the different backups I have, the different deltas, different logs for the systems that we're running. And I'll point out how to do a restore. So this is actually our backup testing demo because my lab is in its own world, but my production system can see both lab and production at the same time. And this is where we would do the restores. So we can do a restore health check by checking this box. We could choose which version. So we'll say maybe this last one we did. And we can choose not only my Labert pool, which is our lab pool. Pool of Zen is our main one, but you get all the different options. You, you can do this cross pool. So you don't have to do DR testing or restores in the pool that they came from or the host they came from. They can all be sent somewhere else, of course. And let's actually just go ahead and do a restore. So if we go here to restore, select the backup. We'll do that one we did today on April 7th. And we'll say, where do we want to land this? Actually, let's bring this over here. We're going to throw it in my uh, system that is destined for production. So this is the SCSI production setup I have. Uh, we can generate a new MAC address. We can start the VM after restore. Yeah, why not? We got it running still. Uh, so I don't necessarily want to have the same MAC address because that would cause a conflict. That would be a bad thing. Uh, we just do that and it's going to run over here and we'll see a task start up for the restore. And it's creating 
running through all the processes and it's going to be restored. It looks like in about two minutes here, I can actually go over to the overview of the backups, go to actually restore and the process is started. You can follow along the process here as it progresses through. So let's uh, do the magic of video editing. Okay. It's going to take probably a total of four minutes to get this done. So through the magic video editing, we're going to jump ahead. All right, the restore has completed in four minutes or more technically three minutes and 48 seconds. And then from here, we can click on it. We can see the storage repository went to, but let's go ahead and go to the VM loading. And it says restored from backup. It gives it the same name, but it does add this because technically now there are two of them. So if I click on YouTube, there's the one that was running here. There's this one here. And because we created new Mac address, uh, this won't have a conflict with the other one running. So if you need to do that, check it. If not, yes, it will just restore with the same Mac address. But as I noted here, restores are relatively easy to do. And one more last thing I'll comment on, because it's the last have in there, is the health checks. And that's because you can have jobs that you have removed, but you still have the backup itself. It'll give you a reason of missing jobs. This is showing up because like this backup testing, as I delete the jobs, the health becomes, hey, the job's missing, but you have a backup. So it lets you know you can keep the backups even if you get rid of the job, but it'll just make a note in here that those things exist. And maybe you want to delete those backups that actually can be done right from here and detach VM snapshots, kind of the same answer. You can have like your deltas where they're going to create snapshots, but then if the job is missing, it goes, I don't know why this snapshots here real referencing a backup job that no longer exists. So I like that they give you some of these maintenance things that you can do in here. Now go back over to restore. This is where you can delete backups as well. So if we hit the trash one here, we can choose all of them or individual ones that we may want to delete. So you just click on them to select them. So if you wanted to purge any of those backups for anything and the metadata is just over here, here's the metadata. If we wanted to do a restore of that. So here's the Zen orchestra Zen lab one, Zen XEPNG, new Ryzen lab. You can see the dates for any of these. Some of these are older because they're older backups that I just haven't really purged. I probably should because uh, I don't think I need anything here for my old April, 2020 lab. And that's all I have on these Zen backups. A few final thoughts though. I really like the validation testing through the health check. I love that they have that feature on there because it doesn't just do the health check. It does it automatically. So you can constantly have some process to validate your VMs and the ability to validate them on maybe a secondary server means we don't just know they work. We know they will work on our backup server if the main server fails. So it kind of comes into that whole continuity. And something I've said a lot is untested backups are just wishful thinking. So having some automation to the testing, taking some of the human factor up, you should still do a full DR plan and walk through every now and then. It's really important to go through, but I think they've made it really easy to integrate this into your full continuity plans that you put together. Nonetheless, leave your thoughts and comments down below. Head over to my forums for more in-depth discussion or connect with me on this and other topics. Head over to the XCPNG forums if you want to discuss things with the developers and kind of look behind the scenes. They're very public about what they're doing, their roadmap going forward. They do all this on GitHub to keep it very transparent. So just one of the beautiful things about open source and uh, it's just a really cool project and a whole team over at Vates that's behind it is pretty awesome. Thanks and see you next time.